Welcome to lesson 2F, Manometers. In this lesson, we'll describe the purpose of a manometer and we'll demonstrate how it works. We'll discuss a simple way to analyze manometers. They can be of any shape and have any kind of fluids in them. We'll also do some example problems along the way. The purpose of a manometer is to measure an unknown pressure or a pressure difference. The only equation we need is our workhorse equation for hydrostatics. Here's a quick demonstration of a YouTube manometer. This is a simple U-tube manometer with a ruler in inches. One side is connected to a tube. Watch what happens when I blow in the tube. I can maintain a height difference between the left and right legs of about 8 inches. I can also suck into the tube. I still obtain the height difference of about 8 inches, but this time in suction. This is the only time I let my students say that Professor Cymbala sucks. A couple notes from the demonstration. When I was blowing, I got 8 inches of water difference between the two legs. From this, we can calculate the gauge pressure in my mouth. It's a gauge pressure because one side of the manometer is open to the atmosphere and the other side is connected to my mouth with a different pressure. So delta P is rho GH, and this is a gauge pressure. We plug in our values rho, G, and H, along with some unity conversion factors, converting from inches to meters, and then a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and a kPa is a thousand newton per meter squared. This gives us 1.993 kPa, or to two significant digits, 2.0 kPa. When we apply suction, we get the same result except with the negative sign. Since the pressure in my mouth was less than atmospheric, we can also write this 2.0 kPa vacuum. Let's learn by example. Suppose we have a U-tube manometer where the right leg is exposed to atmospheric pressure. I drew the little triangle to indicate that. The left leg is exposed to high pressure in tank A through a tube. The liquid or gas that is yellow here has density rho A. The manometer fluid is rho M. Rho M has to be bigger than rho A or else the manometer fluid wouldn't stay on the bottom as shown here. Let's label some points 1, 1 prime, and 2. To solve this we use our equation of hydrostatics. For part A, we want to calculate the absolute and gauge pressures for the general case where rho A is not small compared to rho M. First, we know that P2 is equal to P atmosphere since this surface is exposed to atmospheric pressure. P1 is equal to P1 prime since we can draw a curve from 1 to 1 prime through the same fluid and 1 and 1 prime are at the same elevation. I'm going to show you an easy way to do these kinds of problems. Namely, you pick a point and then work around the manometer tube. In this case, I'm going to start at point PA here and work around counterclockwise. You could start at 2 and work clockwise if you want. From our hydrostatic equation, anytime you go down, you add pressure, and anytime you go up, you subtract pressure. So starting at PA, I first go down to point 1. So PA plus rho A, the yellow fluid here, G, and then delta Z is ZA minus Z2. That gets me to this point. Now I'll go from here to here. Again, I add, since we're going down, we're still in fluid A, rho A, G, Z2 minus Z1. Now I'm at this point. I go around to 1 prime, which is at the same pressure. Now I'm going to go up to point 2. When you go up, you subtract, in this case, rho M, since it's the blue manometer fluid, G. I'm still using absolute value of Z from this equation, but I'm subtracting since we're going up. So this is Z2 minus Z1. Now we're at point 2, which is atmospheric pressure, as we stated here. We used plus signs when we were going down. Pressure is increasing, and we used a negative sign when going up, since pressure is decreasing. So we've worked around from PA counterclockwise all the way up to 2. We can simplify this equation and solve for PA. PA is P atmosphere plus rho M minus rho A, G times the quantity Z2 minus Z1, minus rho A G times the quantity Z A minus Z2. This is our answer for part A. And it's the general case where we haven't made any approximations about the density differences. In some cases, for example, if A is air and M is mercury, the difference between these two densities is huge and you can neglect rho A. I actually don't advise doing this. Solve for the general case and then it works for any fluids here, regardless of how far apart the densities are. But if you want to simplify, when rho A is very small compared to rho M, we can neglect rho A in this term. We cannot neglect rho A in this term, since we don't know how Z A minus Z2 compares with Z2 minus Z1. Our approximate answer is then P A is approximately P atmosphere plus 
rho mg z2 minus z1 minus rho ag za minus z2. And that's our answer to part b. As I said, I would not advise you to do that. Just leave this alone. It doesn't hurt to keep this term in. A quick comment, especially if you're plugging this into some software like Excel or MATLAB, include this term even if it may be negligible, because somewhere down the line you may have two fluids where rho a is not very small compared to rho m, and then you would need that term. It might save you some time in the future. So it is best to keep all terms. Note that the answer is in variable form. You can plug in some numbers yourself. Be careful with units. Let me do another more complicated example. Here we have two tanks, tank A and tank B, three fluids, row A, row M, the manometer fluid, and row B. Again, we'll calculate the general case, and then we can simplify, this time for the case where row A and row B are the same fluid. In general, they are not, and I colored them different colors. Again, we use our hydrostatic equation. Again, I'll start at tank A and work around counterclockwise. PA plus row A, G delta Z, that gets us from here to this point. Now let's go down distance h to this point. The fluid is now rho m, and delta z is h. Again, we used plus signs since we're going down and increasing pressure. Now we're at this point, which is the same as this point, and we go up from there. I'll first go from here up distance h. The fluid is now rho b, so we subtract rho b g h. Then we go up delta z, and we're now at pressure p b. Again, we have negative signs here since we're going up. We want to calculate the difference between p b and p a, so solving for p b minus p a. And rearranging, we get rho m minus rho b g h plus rho a minus rho b times g delta z. This is our general answer. If fluids A and B are the same, these would both be yellow, for example, same fluid, then obviously this term would go to zero. And so PB minus PA is approximately rho M minus rho B or rho A times GH. Notice that delta Z dropped out of the equation in part B. Since these are the same fluids, we can move these tanks up or down as much as we want, and it will not change the result. But in the general case where rho B is not equal to rho A, the delta Z term may be important. Again, I advise not to approximate. Use this full equation or general equation if you're putting this into any kind of software. Now I want to give some notes about manometry. The elevation difference delta z in a U-tube manometer does not depend on the following. Number one, U-tube diameter. We have a caveat that the tube diameter must be large enough so that capillary effects are negligible. As long as that's true, it doesn't matter if the tube is small diameter or large diameter comparing manometers A and B. The height difference and the pressure difference that we calculate will be the same. By the way, these T's ensure that all the manometers experience the same pressure from this pressure chamber A. At height Z1, we can call that 0.1 and P equal P1. So P is P1 there, or 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 there. Since these are all at the same elevation and they all have the same fluids. Our workhorse equation tells us that P is not a function of x or y. That would be the horizontal direction, only z. Therefore, diameter does not matter. Again, as long as it's not too small so that surface tension effects are important. Elevation difference delta z also does not depend on U-tube length, provided they're long enough to include this delta z. For example, compare A and C. All we did was have a shorter manometer. Why do we get the same result? Below interface 1, which is here, nothing matters as long as we have the same fluid. This could be some kind of a weird shape down here, and it still wouldn't matter because you can connect curve from one point to the other on opposite sides. Finally, delta z does not depend on U-tube shape. I showed this already at the bottom of the manometer tube, but now if we compare A and D, D is drawn with this large portion, which we call a reservoir. Some commercial manometers are built this way, so that we have a large volume of manometer fluid, and this level, which we call Z1, does not change very much. And it can make it easier because you just measure from there to the height of the manometer fluid on the other side. We also have an inclined tube on the right in manometer D. What is the advantage of the so-called inclined manometer? Well, let's think about it. If we have a vertical tube, compared to an inclined tube of the same diameter, and we look at some height difference, let's say it's one centimeter in both cases. Well, either you have a ruler or you have tick marks on the tube itself. If I draw the tick marks evenly spaced in both cases, I didn't draw this to scale, but you can see that I have approximately twice as many tick marks here as I do here. So if I'm reading this height, I have better resolution with the inclined manometer. 
In other words, there's more tick marks per centimeter in this case compared to this case, which gives me better resolution. Now let's look at some cases where the elevation difference delta Z does depend on some properties. First, manometer fluid. Here I use a different manometer fluid. Suppose this one's water and this one's mercury. Well, these are not to scale, but the mercury is much heavier than the water. And so for a certain rho GH, we would have a bigger height for the water than we would for the mercury. I'll label these positions 1 and 2. By the way, which manometer A or E would have better resolution? Well, again, if you think of a tube with tick marks, and we have the same tick marks on our tubes, we have a much smaller height for E than we have for A. In other words, we have less tick marks to read, so again, we have better resolution with manometer A. For the second case, I drew manometer A again, except the whole manometer is moved down. I call this manometer A prime. Same manometer fluids, but now we have a bigger elevation difference down to the manometer. Delta ZA prime will not be the same as delta ZA. So vertical location of the manometer does matter. Note that I'm ignoring changes in atmospheric pressure. So it turns out that delta ZA prime is greater than delta ZA. This height is greater than this height. Why? Well, the yellow liquid has some density. We labeled that density rho 1. And since we moved our manometer down some distance, I'll call that H, we have an additional rho 1 GH pressure on the left leg of manometer A prime all else being equal and ignoring changes in atmospheric pressure from here to here. This higher pressure causes the manometer fluid to rise higher. Therefore, delta ZA prime is greater than delta ZA. I can label these 1 prime and 2 prime. We approximate that P2 prime is equal to P2 is equal to P atmosphere. I summarize by saying that the higher pressure in manometer A prime pushes the blue manometer fluid higher on the right side compared to manometer A, as I've sketched here. Finally, if fluid 1 is air, for example, and fluid 2 is mercury, then these two delta Zs would be approximately the same. We typically make this approximation when fluid 1 is a gas. But the effect can be significant if both of the fluids are liquids. So again, I advise you not to make such approximations to avoid future errors. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.